may have joined you in the course of the day. I'm James Harding. Um, I'm the editor and co-founder here at Tortoise. Uh, just to say, um, I'm probably more excited than I should be, really, that Jen Easterly is joining us. Uh, it's silly, isn't it? But I still do get excited by the possibility of speaking to, pe speaking to people who really know their way around this. And Jen, I'm, I should also say, I think that we met when you were working. Did you work for Condi Rice back in the before times, a long, long time ago. So I remember seeing your name. I thought, oh my goodness. Um, where are you, Jenny? Are you in DC? It seems I've been around a long time, James. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much. Um, I was just speaking to uh, Gordon Carrera, who's the BBC's um, uh, intelligence correspondent. And uh, we were saying how exciting it was that you, Ron and CISA, was here and joining us. And um, uh, and we're talking just about the range of things that CETA now has responsibility for um, and that you personally have been in this world uh, of, of cyber and the US's cyber defences for some time, not least as we were pointing out that you spent a fair bit of your career actually building these cyber defences. So, Jen, we've got, I know, just until the top of the hour, so I should just say to everyone in the room and everyone who's joining us online, this is one of those moments where politeness is not your friend. If you have something that you want to say to Jen, please just catch my eye and I'll make sure to, uh, to bring you in. Um, Jen, we've had a conversation that, that's gone through the morning that's, that's talked about big picture cyber threats, geopolitical cyber threats, um, and a good deal that hit us as companies and citizens. And I wondered whether we could start there with the US experience on ransomware, because picking up on the earlier conversations for today, one of the things that's come up is the extent of the gray area around what's expected of companies and citizens, but mostly big businesses when they're on the end of a ransomware attack what the state expects of them, what their shareholders expect of them, what their customers and employees expect of them. And I'm just wondering whether you could just take us through what you expect of them, what you would like companies to do in the event they're on the end of a ransomware attack. Yeah. Well, first of all, James, it's great to be with everybody. I am uh, coming to you from Aspen, and my connection may be slightly unstable, so apologies uh, for that. Um, it's a great question. Look, we're all uh, dealing with this. Uh, you know, ransomware, as I'm sure folks have said earlier today, has been around for a, a while. It's not a new thing. But I think the reason that everybody is talking about it now is the attacks that we've seen in particular over the past uh, year and a half. And some of that is because we have seen uh, so many people move to remote environments where uh, their networks are less protected than they would have been if they're inside a business enclave. Uh, but we've seen a massive uptick in these attacks. And uh, again, I think they have caught the eye because they're actually affecting the everyday lives uh, of people all over the world. Certainly attacks against critical infrastructure uh, that we've seen earlier this year affecting things like how people get gas at the pump, how they get food at the grocery store, how they get money. Uh, from the bank, and then certainly attacks that we've been seeing uh, in schools and hospitals. So very worrisome, this, this massive uptick. And again, it's really taking hold because it is starting to affect, affect everyday, everyday lives. You know, one of the things uh, that I talked about, whether it was in my earlier career in the military or in the intelligence community or at the White House or the last uh, four and a half years, uh, at Morgan Stanley is we have to look at this not as the purview of the information technology folks or the uh, CISOs. Uh, this is really something that needs to be seen as a business risk and uh, in some cases an existential risk. So, you know, the first thing that I would say in particular to the business community is that we need to look at this as something that is the responsibility of the CEO and of the board. Uh, this is not something that your information technology folks are gonna uh, are gonna just take care of for you. And I think people are realizing that. So that's that's good news. You know, in CISA, and I have to tell you that because it's a hotly debated topic, but we pronounce it CISA, um, <laughs> the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, our job is to, and it's probably good to baseline a little bit um, because some of your audience may not know who we are because we are the newest agency in the federal government. We've been around since we were established in law at the end of 2018, and we were really established by the Congress to fill a gap. Uh, 
So we are the nation's cyber and infrastructure defense agency. And the idea is we lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk uh, to the physical and the digital infrastructure uh, that Americans rely on every day to do everything that they need to do to run their lives. I mean, we live in a highly digitized world. And so at the end of the day, what we are uh, in the business of is cyber defense. So we are here to uh, assist those businesses with doing what they need to do to keep themselves safe and secure and their networks resilient. And then if they do become victim to something like ransomware, we are here to step in and render assistance and help them get back up and running as soon as possible. But other than treating this as a business risk, and in some cases an existential business risk, the thing that I would like uh, companies to do is to help us uh, from a reporting perspective, there's some legislation working its way through our Congress now. It's really important that we get information when people do suffer these attacks so that we can not only render assistance, but we can use that information in an anonymized way that protect, protects privacy, but we can use it to be able to warn other potential victims. And that's the essence of what we call collective defense. You know, in a perfect world, and I realize we live in a very, very imperfect world, James, but in a perfect world, you would not see uh, these types of attacks happening more than once. And so working together as a community in partnership with private, with the private sector, with the government, really with the international community, uh, we can make progress, uh, but it's a really complex problem and one that takes cyber defenders, but also all instruments of our national power and global power to hold uh, actors accountable, uh, to use our treasury sanctions, to use law enforcement indictments, to use diplomatic pressure. And so a lot of effort being put here. But, you know, I tell businesses, treat this as a business risk and then report it when something happens. And Jen, can I ask you, I'm sure people in the room want to weigh in, but can I, can I ask you, firstly, thank you for the clarification on CISA. You say tomato. I will make sure that that's the way I uh, report it from here on in. But but when you talk about the CEOs and the boards, right? They've got to take responsibility for this. They will say, effectively, back at you. They will say, we need to have clarity on two things: who can I tell, or who should I tell, and what can I pay? And the the what you hear from boards and ceos is the reason why ransomware is so complicated is there's such a legislative loophole here in terms of what's required of company officers in the event of a ransomware attack so i wondered i know there's legislation going through but i wondered whether you could talk a little bit about what your ideal regulatory environment would be because it feels as though it's a long way short of what's needed Sure. So, you know, with respect to the, the ransom uh, issue, uh, obviously, I think everybody knows uh, the strong recommendation uh, of the U.S. government is not to pay a ransom. Um, first of all, you can't be sure that you're going to get your data back. And secondly, all it does is to continue to incentivize the ransomware business model. So we're pretty clear on that. There's no regulation on it. But again, we're in the business of cyber defense. So we are trying to prevent uh, ransomware attacks from happening. And I think it's really important, James, to recognize that the vast majority of these attacks are in fact avoidable. If you look at uh, the attacks that have been successful, they're because people have not done the basics to ensure that they are protecting themselves. You know, 90% uh, of successful cyber attacks uh, happen with a phishing email. Uh, you know, you are 99% less likely to have your account hacked if you implement multi-factor authentication. So, you know, at the end of the day, it really comes back to the basics. And I realize some of this can sound technical and, you know, scary and all that. But what we are saying is that understand the basics, invest in your cybersecurity team, make this a board level issue, and you will actually create the resilience you need so you don't have to worry about getting into those very difficult conversations. And I recognize that about whether you can or you should uh, pay a ransom to these criminals. And what do you think, Jenna? I'd love to know from, you, from where you sit what the map of ransomware attacks looks like. Because the thing that's been surprising in Europe and the UK in the last, even in the last six to 12 months, 
is is little businesses, smaller standalone public organizations and institutions that find themselves hit by uh, ransomware attacks. And I wonder when you, I imagine that somewhere there's a map that lights up in the United States. And I wonder just geographically, sectorally, by size of business, whether there's a map that's emerging of the people who get who do get themselves on the end of a ransomware attack. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think the, I, I don't have a map in front of me, but I would tell you that uh, every entity, large and small, uh, is vulnerable. And so we have seen ransomware attacks on large businesses, on small businesses, on critical infrastructure, on uh, individuals. So I think the larger point here is that nobody is uh, invulnerable. Nobody is accepted from potentially being a victim of ransomware. And it's why we continue to beat the drum about there are some very basic things you can do. And I like to refer to it since I'm a retired military officer as left of boom to prevent yourself from being uh, from becoming victim to a ransomware attack. So I just want everybody to realize that there's nothing that's going to necessarily uh, save you because you're a small business or a medium business or a large business. Everyone is vulnerable. And, and I think it also brings up a really important point, James, is as you know, we live in a highly digitized world. Everything is connected. Everything is interdependent. So everything is vulnerable. And, you know, there are great things that come out of that connectivity, but there's also an increasing attack surface. So that's why these basic best practices, uh, what we call cyber hygiene, the brushing your teeth, the washing your hands of cyber, are actually incredibly important to being able to protect yourself and create resilience. Jen, thank you. I'm going to invite Jonathan. Do you want to weigh in? Um... Uh, Thanks, Jen. Jen's on the screen so far away. Uh, hi, Jen. Thanks very much for joining us today. I'm Jonathan from Cylon. I wanted to ask what proportion of your time uh, and what percentage of your budget you allocate to uh, stimulating innovation and the private sector as opposed to defending, uh, defending the state, as it were, and what would be the ideal proportion? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I spent my life, Jonathan, in national security. So I was in Intel, uh, I was in the military, I did a lot of work in counterterrorism and then cybersecurity. And uh, it's interesting because in national security, the federal government really has a monopoly. Uh, in homeland security and cybersecurity, the federal government is just a co equal partner uh, with our state and local teammates and with the private sector. And so much of what we do is all about collaboration and partnership. I mentioned at the outset that our mission is to, to manage and reduce risk to critical infrastructure. As I'm sure most people know, more than 85% of our critical infrastructure is in private hands. So this is something where the federal government can play an important role, but the lion's share of the work here is done in partnership with the private sector. So the vast majority of my time from an operational level is actually uh, building and cultivating and strengthening the very important partnerships that we have with the private sector. One of the cool things that uh, we launched shortly after I got here is called the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative or JCDC. I'm a big 80s music fan, so um, <laughs> sort of like ACDC, it's easy to remember. Uh, and so the whole theory of the case on this is we bring together the power of the federal cyber ecosystem, so CISA, NSA, FBI, DOD, Cybercom, uh, ODNI, our, our intelligence colleagues, uh, with the private sector. And we come together and, you know, we have some plank holders that were brought in first to help us solve the visibility issue because we do not have and we do not want from a government level visibility into the domestic infrastructure. Uh, and so we brought these uh, partners together to enable us to create a common operating picture of the threat environment, to plan and exercise against it, and then to implement those plans uh, collectively to drive risk at scale. And I think that's one of the most important initiatives that CISA has going. And I've personally put a lot of my time in it. Uh, actually, at Aspen, I'm spending a good bit of time talking about it today with our private sector colleagues out here. So, you know, the one thing I always say is cybersecurity is a team sport. 
uh, and the private sector is one of our uh, absolutely critical partners in this space to make a difference in helping to secure the nation and really to secure the globe. And the last thing I'd say, you probably talked earlier about the National Cybersecurity Center. Uh, I was in the UK a couple weeks ago uh, meeting with Lindy Cameron and her team. We have a fabulous partnership with them. Also had a chance to meet with my friend Kieran Martin, who is a uh, superstar, uh, you know, we met with some of their partners in what they call I-100, Industry 100, uh, to help learn some of those lessons uh, from their successes so that we can extend them into the JCDC model as we build it. Uh, and it's a great, it's a great example of learning from each other uh, based on the special relationship we have with the UK. Th thank you, Jonathan. Um, Jen, can, can I turn to something else. I, th I think I'm right that C CISA is responsible too for misinformation or to trying to deal with misinformation in, in the US. And I just wondered whether you talk a little bit about that. I think many people would f say that in the West, it feels as though we're losing the battle for truth and whether you think that's a fair assessment and what you feel can reasonably be done about it. Yeah, it's a great question, James. You know, this is something that as a citizen uh, and really as a mom, <laughs> I worry about uh, a lot um, significantly. You know, the idea you go back to 1770 and our second president, John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. Yes. Well, we now live in a world where facts ain't so stubborn anymore, right? We have alternative facts. And so I really worry about the misinformation and disinformation because you and I know that you need the best information, you need uh, facts to be able to make the best decisions. So uh, at the end of last year, as you probably know, my predecessor and good friend, Chris Krebs, uh, as part of our efforts to help secure election infrastructure, uh, started something called the Rumor Control Site, which was really about just putting out facts so that the American people understood uh, all of the efforts that our state and local officials were doing to secure election infrastructure. And the site was uh, actually incredibly successful uh, in getting those facts out and was really welcomed by the state and local election officials in cutting through some of the noises out there uh, to help um, people understand, again, the ground truth. And so we uh, plan to continue with that effort. We also plan to do uh, some innovative things. We have some graphic novels uh, that, they, that we have published that we're testing out. Uh, and we are going to strengthen our efforts because I do believe it's incredibly important, at least in the mission set that we have, which is all about the protection of critical infrastructure, to take on uh, the misinformation, disinformation space. If you think about it, you know, our mission is critical infrastructure. The most important critical infrastructure, that, in, excuse me, critical infrastructure there is, is our cognitive infrastructure. And so building that resilience is you know, part of the mission set, in my view. And to just explain about the graphic novels, the idea that you're going to start trying to make facts interesting? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're just coming up with innovative ways, and I'm happy to send you one, James. Mm -hmm. uh, innovative ways to get some messaging out, to get some traction. Uh, right now, we're just leveraging social media. Yeah. Uh, but again, this is something I really care about and think is super important. So we're looking for innovative ways to get information out there that will have traction. And a lot of this is focused on raising awareness about uh, how certain foreign actors are uh, you know, doing influence operations to impact our democracy. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, free and fair elections are the bedrock of democracy. And so it's a really important effort to be able to go after it from a cybersecurity perspective, but also to deal with the misinformation, disinformation aspect of it. Jen, can I ask you, I, I'm going to please do Wayne, but I, I'd, I'd love to ask you a little bit about the credibility of the cyber industry, both both in the public sector, both in government and in the private sector. And I suppose I go all the way back to Y2K. I look back and think there were historically these great fears of assaults on our way of life. Everything would get frozen. As you say, critical infrastructure would collapse and then it doesn't happen. And then the curious thing about that is, of course, people are suspicious of the cyber industry as peddling fear. And how do you make sure that, that, that you 
responsibly and accurately reflect the real threats without either underselling them or, in fact, overselling them? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And when I was at Morgan Stanley, we dealt with this a lot because we would have clients that came into our cyber fusion center and wanted to understand everything that we were doing uh, to protect the firm, protect their assets. Look, I'm a big believer that fear doesn't, doesn't result in anything productive, right? When you're scared of something, your brain in some measure really shuts down. So I don't think that fear at all is the answer here. I think uh, arming people with an understanding of the threat environment is important, but really at the end of the day, arming them with what they need to do to protect themselves. You know, and businesses are different. As a big bank, uh, we had hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to build uh, capabilities, technology, and to hire people that enabled us to defend the bank and uh, the larger financial services ecosystem because we're always uh, focused on systemic and cascading risk. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we always went back to the basics, right? Over 90% of successful cyber attacks start with the phishing email. It's why the basics of things like uh, updating your software, using a password manager to generate and store unique passwords, thinking before you click, and then implementing MFA. You know, I'm on this, um, I'm on this uh, campaign here because tomorrow is uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month in uh, the US and we are really trying to get our messaging out to the American people because I think it's incredibly important that you know those basic steps and fear is not the answer. And, you know, frankly, the cybersecurity industry are great partners and yes, there is a profit motive, but I think increasingly they realize that they have a responsibility to make sure that they are partnered uh, with the American people and with industry uh, to make sure that we are doing the right thing because as everything is connected, this is ulti <clears throat> ultimately a national security issue. Jen, thank you. you had a question. Hi, it's great to be here in person. My name I, is Anushka Sharma. I'm very nice. founder of NOR, and I also work in high performance computers in an academic environment. And the beautiful thing about where we are right now is technology is so innovative and magical that it's become seamless and all these barriers and usability of it mean that we haven't had to think about so many of the things that we've forgotten in that education side of things. But there are two human emotions that play such a big part and we never talk about them in rooms like this, and that's embarrassment and shame. <laughs> How do we... Um, like as leaders help people in our organizations to get over the shame and embarrassment that they may have messed up. And that starts from the top, but it also starts from the bottom and we have to meet somewhere in the middle. And I haven't heard anyone talk about that yet. So that was just my only comment Anushka, that I wanted brilliant. to share. <laughs> brilliant, Jen. Oh man, I love that question. I love it, <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, <laughs> This is actually something uh, that, you know, speaks to me personally, and I can kind of riff on this in many directions. Um, but part of what I am trying to do is we transform CISA to be the cyber and infrastructure defense agency that our nation deserves, is to make sure that we are building uh, a culture. And, and I think culture is so important there uh, of psychological safety, right, where people can fail, uh, where people... Uh, can uh, reveal themselves, where people can show, show vulnerabilities, uh, where people can admit that they don't understand something uh, without feeling like they're embarrassed or should feel a sense of shame. Like you've probably read a lot of Brene Brown. I'm a big fan of her. She's a shame researcher. But this is all about creating cultures of excellence. And so we talk a lot about what's the culture we want. It's collaboration. It's teamwork. It's trust trust, right? It's transparency, it's innovation, it's inclusion, it's ownership, it's empowerment, so important. But at the end of the day, if you look at the studies, and Google did a great study, I think it was um, Project Aristotle, uh, the key to any great organization is not having the best tech Technologists, although I think it's super cool, you're in high performance computing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's ensuring that you have psychological safety. So people feel like they can be vulnerable, they can admit to mistakes, and that you create an environment where failure is okay, right? Because you constantly learn from failure. 
And so I love that question because I think it, it speaks to what we're trying to do to create a great culture that ultimately will attract and retain uh, the best talent to help us be successful in keeping the nation safe and cyber. Thank you. Uh, Anushka, thank you. I, I realize we're coming towards the end of uh, our time, so I'm going to finish with two questions. One is one starts with a little bit of embarrassment, Jane, which is, I don't know what, I don't know what left of boom means, so would you explain that? And, and the other one is, I think lots of people here in the room will take some comfort from the fact, you know, you're here a couple of weeks ago, you see Lindy Cameron, you, you know, you say how much you admire Kieran Martin, but there's, there's a sense in this particular sort of part of the of our lives, that there's not really great global coordination, that there's not a kind of multilateralism when the problem itself seems so obviously international. And I just wondered how much you think that's a real worry and how much you think there's any realistic chance of something that's a kind of Bretton Woods for cyber. Yeah, so I'll take the first one on and it's super cool to talk about it because uh, I know you're gonna be talking to Keith Alexander. Uh, next, who is uh, somebody that I've worked for. He's uh, been a mentor of mine since the 90s when I was a young army captain and he was an army colonel. Uh, but we worked together at NSA. And one of the uh, most important things that I was able to work on with him was a project called Real-Time Regional Gateway, which was a high technology effort. It was highly classified at the time. It's since been declassified. But it was when I was in Baghdad and we were trying to find a way to bring all of the information and the data together that was accessible to help us enrich it and correlate it and integrate it so we could illuminate, illuminate terrorist networks uh, that were responsible for uh, improvised explosive devices. As you probably recall in the 06, 07 timeframe when I was there during the surge, it was all about these IEDs uh, that Al Qaeda in Iraq we're using to create catastrophic impacts on our troops, uh, both the US and of course our, our coalition partners and Iraqi civilians. And so what we were trying to do was to break into that cycle so that we could, could go left of boom, right? Before the IED went off. So it's all about getting left of attacks so that we can prevent the attack from happening. And this capability, uh, it was really hard to get it up and running, uh, but under General Alexander, General Petraeus's, uh, General McChrystal's leadership, we were able to provide a capability to the Joint uh, Special Operations Command that ultimately helped them take a, you know thousands of these insurgents off the battlefield before uh, these bombs actually went off. So it was one of the best things that I've been able to do. And again, it was um, really a great partnership with Keith Alexander and the team at NSA. Um, so that's what left a boom means. Hopefully you got it, James. Um, and then uh, uh, your, your question on international collaboration. You know, I would just say I've only been at CISA uh, 11 weeks, I guess, less than, less than three months. Uh, and I have spent time, uh, as I said, with the UK, but with our Australian partners, our Canadian partners, our New Zealand partners, my Singaporean partners, Israeli partners, with NATO, with Interpol. This to me, you know, cyber is a team sport, and that's not just with our US partners. This is truly a global, uh, it has to be a global partnership because as you know, everything is connected, right? I'm a big Douglas Adams fan. So to Dirk Gently's uh, holistic detective agency, right? <laughs> everything is connected. Everything is connected. Everything is interdependent. Everything is vulnerable. So those partnerships are absolutely critical to our success in this space. And uh, I am very hopeful that we're going to continue to be able to strengthen uh, that collaboration uh, as I continue in this uh, in this job. Jen, thank you. Um, we, we really appreciate your time and so won't um, indulge, indulge more of it. Um, I hope that when you're next in the UK, you'll come, come and see us in person. It would be great uh, to see you again in person. But I just wanted to say on behalf of all of us here, we can only imagine the demands on your time. So it's terrific uh, to hear from you. Um, we, you're not really going to quite hear it, but there's going to be a vaint, the faint sound of applause now. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, um, James. It's great to be with you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in person when I'm back in the UK. Thanks so much, Jen. Have a good day. You too.